Yeah. So. Good morning. It's good to see that those of you who went on the canoe trip survived. Let's try this again. Good morning. There we go. Uh, we're glad that you've joined us today, and thank you guys for joining us online. Uh, but uh, Wednesday, September 1st, a uh, few announcements we got going on here. Uh, There's a ladies' luncheon at 12 p.m. at the pizza place. So mark your calendar, ladies. Uh, that's going to be a good time. Friday, September 3rd, uh, we're going to have Broom Tree. And things have changed a little bit with Broom Tree. Broom Tree is now grades 2 through 5. So <clears throat> Broom Tree has kind of changed a little more towards a children's ministry and uh, that is grades 2 through 5 6 to 9 p.m. Friday September the 3rd and from that from what I understand right now we're only going to have it once a month so we're having like youth group once a month and broom tree once a month uh, for this f at the current time period all right uh, Saturday September 4th uh, is a golf tournament at 9 a.m. It benefits LifeWise Academy of New Lexington. It's uh, hosted by Ebenezer Baptist Church of Logan. $75 for an individual or $300 for, the t for a team. Uh, if you'd like to sponsor a whole, if you have a business or would like to just privately sponsor a whole, I believe it's $100, and you can call 740 three eight five eight four one one or visit www.ebc1837.com to sign up uh, also there is no junior church today grades one through four so if you're in grades one through four you get to stay up here with us today uh, one other thing uh, today as we've been announcing over the last few weeks we are going to take up a special offering for LifeWise Academy. Any money that is given, from what I understand, is doubled. Uh, and I want to, I, I know, I want you guys to know uh, LifeWise, uh, LifeWise Academy is a, what is known as release time religious instruction. And we are currently uh, helping to sponsor this and uh, get it up and running at Junction City Elementary School. So with that said, we're going to have Jordan come up and share with us an update. Uh, we will be talking more about this because this is a tremendous opportunity. And in fact, last week I told you that there was over 100 kids, right, signed up to leave their classroom during the day, go to an off-site location, and learn the Bible. So that number is now up to 126, which is really exciting. And that actually extends over uh, 92 different families. So that's really great. Um, just to give you an idea of what your money is going towards today, um, I, for many of you, you may not realize this is a pop-up classroom being used at the Junction City Community Building. So anything a classroom would need is getting purchased. Um, an idea would be furniture um, that will be set up and torn down every single week. Um, classroom supplies such as Bibles, journal journals, pencils, crayons, scissors, um, just 
anything and everything, glue, all that good stuff that a classroom needs. Um, and then I also wanted to invite you all to uh, a community prayer gathering for um, the start of LifeWise on Tuesday night at 8.30 at the community building. They'll be setting up the classroom that night at 8 o'clock, and then afterward, they'll come together and pray as a community. So we really love to see as many people there as we can possibly get. So if you have any questions, um, you can come see me uh, anytime. Call me, text me. I'm actually leaving for a baptism now, so if you need anything, you can see my husband, and he can let me know. But we appreciate everything you can give, and uh, we thank you. We have one question before you leave. How much does it cost one student for the year to participate in LifeWise? Now, it doesn't actually cost the student anything. Right. That is why we're taking up offerings. But it costs those of us who are being a part of supporting this ministry, how much per student? $120 a year. So if you give $120, you are investing in the life of one student. Okay? No, that's not true. You're investing in the life of two students because that money's doubled. Right. All right? So this is a tremendous opportunity. At the end of the service, uh, Ronell will have a plate in the back and we'll take up an offering uh, and make checks payable to? LifeWise. Uh, New Lexington. You need to put that on there. New Lexington Perry. LifeWise, New Lexington Perry. And if you're watching at home and you want to give, you can mail your checks to the church. Uh, LifeWise, New Lexington Perry. There's also ways that you can give online uh, as a continual gift, right? Correct. You can do that at www.lifewiseacademy.org forward slash donation. And then you, it will have the option to find New Lexington in a drop down list. So you can click on that and it goes directly to the New Lex uh, branch. And any money that we give will be doubled. So that's critical. $120. To put us take a child from the classroom and put them in another classroom where they're going to learn the Bible and our goal is to get this at New Lexington Elementary next year and, uh, and we're already the middle school as well and the middle school yeah, Wow that's the goal oh praise I the Lord had a question. I'm not sure I'm not sure <laughs> as to how long will the the donations be doubled yeah that um i'll find out for you all right thank you all right thank you well you guys ready to worship this morning let's stand let's pray Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We praise you this day for the great God that you are. We pray, Father, that you would still our hearts just now, that you would help us to totally, 100%, tune in to you. Lord, may you be honored and glorified by everything that happens here today. Lord, show us your strength. Show us your power. Work among us. Work in our hearts, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> How lovely is your dwelling place, O oh Lord Almighty, for my soul longs and even thanks for you, for my heart is satisfied.
Yeah. 
song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
Good morning. If you have your Bibles, open them with me to the book of John, chapter 10. We are coming back to what we have taken a long break from, and that is our journey with John. And uh, I want to kind of start back at the beginning for a little bit to reintroduce ourselves back into the book of John. But if you're going on a journey, typically you have a destination. Unless you're one of those kind of people that just say, hey, we're going on vacation, let's get in the car and go. Has there anybody ever done that before? A few of you. Don't really know where you're going. Don't really know what you're doing. But, you're, but typically, when you get in a car to go on a journey, you have a destination. Uh, I've had a few interesting journeys over the year, one of which I was taking a mission team to Colorado and uh, uh, like literally a week before we were supposed to leave and the mission team included all four of my children uh, who were children they weren't what you know today they were children uh, a week before we had to leave my wife had an emergency surgery and was unable to go so here's me in a minivan with four kids and the youth leader who was another kid <laughs> uh, on a journey to Colorado, but we had a destination, and every journey typically has a destination. And even if you leave out on vacation without a particular point in mind on the, on the GPS or on old school map, uh, you have a destination. That's to have some fun. Well, the destination of the book of John is faith. And in the book of John, he answers the most important question that, Jesus, that anyone will ever ask, and that is, who is Jesus? Uh, it's John is here the fourth gospel there's four gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John but John's different than the other three the other three are what's called the synoptic gospels and they're they're historical in nature where John is more heavenly in nature John starts off right off the bat talking about the divinity of Jesus Christ and that is the major focus of his book the deity of of Christ and John's gospel as we have learned uh, through our study is evangelistic at heart but the purpose of the gospel of John is found here in John chapter 20 verse 31 it says there but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name so the destination of this book is faith. Turn to your neighbor and say, my destination's faith. Our destination is faith. That is what John wrote this book for, so that we could read this book and what? Believe. John, the author known as one of the sons of thunder. He was, he, was called, he was called that because he asked Jesus if he, if he wanted them to call down fire from heaven and destroy some people who rejected Jesus. He was quite ambitious. Shall we just go down fire and destroy these people? But he later be no, became known as the apostle of love. Now think about that. From the beginning, let's call down fire and destroy these people to being known as the apostle of love. And I think that right there speaks to the tremendous impact Jesus has on the life of an individual. To be one minute, let's just kill them all, to the next minute, God loves you so much. He loves the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. Yes, that's in the book of John. That whoever believes in him should not perish. goes from one minute wanting them to perish to one minute not wanting them to perish and it was the tremendous impact Jesus had in the life of this apostle he wrote these things so that you may believe Romans 10 17 says so faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ there's a quote that nobody can really 
figure out who said it. Uh, I think nobody wants to lay claim to it. But originally, the quote was attributed, attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. And the quote is this, it's preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Well, from what I found, he, ever, he, ne he never actually said that. What he actually said was the following. It is no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. As for me, he goes on to say, I desire this privilege from the Lord, that never may I have any privilege from man except to do reverence to all and to convert the world by obedience to the holy rule rather by example than by word. Think about that saying for a moment. Preach the gospel at all times and when necessary use words I I think I know what someone meant perhaps when they said that our lives should say the thing, same things as our mouths because you see that oftentimes and and when talking to somebody well I don't go to church because why there's a bunch of what there hypocrites what we say with our life doesn't match what comes out our mouth now I think that's what he means but the problem is, is you can't preach the gospel without using words. You see, it's not just enough to be a good person in front of other people. It's not just enough to be nice to other people. We have to preach the gospel, and the gospel is words. Why? Because faith comes from not seeing. Faith comes from, say it with me, hearing. So how are they going to hear if they just see what we're doing? They have to hear the gospel. In other words, we have to be vocal. That's what John is doing here in his book. He's being vocal. He is telling the world, I want you to believe in Jesus Christ. You know what? That should be the desire of every one of our hearts. For someone who does not believe in Jesus Christ to believe in Jesus Christ. That's why we're here today. That's why I, I stand in front of you. That's what God has called my life to, to getting people to believe in Jesus Christ. You know what? But that's not just my calling. That's your calling. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That's what John's doing here. He's laying out evidence. He gives us the testimony of John the Baptist. He gives us the testimony of the disciples. Then he talks about the works and the miracles of Christ, and, and now he's getting to the words of Christ. And that by reading what he says about Jesus, by his account of what takes place, he's hoping that you come to believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and that by believing you may have life. Now, belief here means more than intellectual assent. I can look at the facts and believe that George Washington was our first president. He's on the one dollar bill I've seen paintings of him in Washington DC I was taught about him in school but you see saving faith is more than that biblically biblical faith is relational and we're gonna see that here in a minute because the title of the message is the title of the passage and the title of the passage is the Good Shepherd and the Good Shepherd has a relationship with his sheep and the sheep have a relationship with the with the shepherd the Greek word here for belief is in the present tense it's not something that happened in the past it's something that will it's not something that will happen in the future is it's right now do you believe right now because that's why John wrote this book doesn't mean that you're perfect Paul wrote about that in Romans chapter 7 for I know that nothing good dwells in me. Woo. Think about that for a minute. Nothing good dwells in me. You know what? We like to think sometimes we're a pretty good person. If the Apostle Paul says there's nothing good dwells in him, do you honestly think there's something good dwells in you? I mean, he wrote half, I mean, the biggest part of the New Testament. Nothing good dwells in me. For the willing or the desire is present in me, but the doing of the good is not in other words I want to do good but I just don't do it can you relate to that you know what 
I want to do good, but I, I, I struggle. Saving faith doesn't mean that you're perfect. It means that you struggle in those areas. And I'm, changed, I'm not changed by my belief that George Washington was the first president. Nor do I have any kind of relationship with George Washington. Belief isn't just a matter of the head. It's a matter of the heart. And that's why he's writing here. He's writing so that you won't just hear these things and believe in your head that Jesus died. Or believe in your head that Jesus was a good person. Or believe in your head that he was even the son of God and the sacrifice for your sin. You can believe that, but have you accepted that in your heart? Has it made it, has it transformed your life? Have you put all of your faith and trust in that? See, he wants you to believe so that you'll have life. The Greek word there is zoe. It means both physical present and spiritual, particularly future existence. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting zoe, everlasting life. John 10, 10 says, I have came, or I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. See, John and Jesus both want you to believe. And they want you to believe so that you can have the one thing that you don't have, life. You see, you might think you have life. And here, obviously, I'm not talking to the believer. Because if you are a believer, you have life. But you see, when you're born, you're born spiritually dead. You are born uh, because you have inherited this nature of sin, this curse that Adam has passed down throughout all humanity, death. The wages of sin is death. You see, when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit in the garden, they didn't instantly die physically, but they did spiritually. And they have passed that on to everyone. And that's why Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born Again, you must have a spiritual birth. And that spiritual birth takes place when you believe. And when you believe, you are spiritually born again, and then you have life. Well, we've went through chapters 5 through, we're in 10, but chapters 5 through 11 are known as the festival cycle. In other words, Jesus, there's festivals in chapter 5. I believe it's the Passover. could be Pentecost or Tabernacles. But we know that we've, if you remember that we talked about how Jesus went up to the, went to Jerusalem at Pentecost and the Tabernacles, the male Jews and Passover were required to come to the temple. We, if you remember, there was the Feast of Tabernacles where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the living water. But now we get into the festival of dedication or the feast of dedication. And here throughout all of these chapters, 5 through 11, Jesus is calling them to believe in him. But he says something that they have a hard time swallowing. He says, no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. In other words... The only way that you can come, and you have a moral responsibility to answer the call to come. That's what Jesus says. Come believe. That is your responsibility. You have that responsibility. But you know what? You can't come to believe on your own. It's a work of God in your heart. God works in your heart. You respond to that. Why? Because we wouldn't come to God apart from God. In chapter 8, Jesus gets in a confrontation with the Jewish leadership, the establishment. Now think about this. These people believe that they are representing God on earth. 
they have a very elaborate religious institution and here comes this man who claims to be God telling them you need to believe in me and abandon this whole religious structure that you've created that is not from God in fact in chapter 8 he says something that shakes them to the core he says you are of your father anybody remember the devil he tells these religious people who think they're right with God you're of your father the devil he's a liar he's a murderer and so are you so now the Jews because remember when you see the Jews that's talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees it's not talking about the Jews as a whole it's talking about the religious leaders now they have a, an official position on Jesus what do you think that is kill him and in fact I think there's been three times when they've tried to kill him up to this point but throughout these chapters he's still calling people to believe now here we see in chapter 10 where we're at today the feast of dedications what the Jews call Hanukkah and this is a celebration remembering the recovery of Jerusalem and the rededication of the temple after the Maccabean Wars you see back during the mm, the 140s yeah the ones Judas Maccabeus was in 165 BC but back in that time Judaism between the Old Testament and the New Testament the nation of Israel was called was becoming Hellenized has anyone ever heard that term before Hellenized it means they were being influenced by the Greek culture Greek culture was called Hellenization if a culture was being Hellenized it mean it was meaning that Greek culture was heavily influencing the nation of Israel now God had specifically laid out what he expected from Israel but they allowed other people they compromised they allowed other people to dictate how they would run the temple how they would live their lives and in fact Greek soldiers came in and desecrated the temple with pig blood and then those same Greek soldiers basically said you know what uh, we're not going to allow any of your religious practices such as circumcision but the reason why these Greek soldiers came and did that and then eventually set up a pagan idol in the temple was because the leadership of the Jewish state of the Jewish religion was compromised and corrupt and their compromising and their corruption led ultimately to the demise of the temple well a group known group known as the Maccabeans basically waged a war took back over the temple rededicated the temple to God and now that's what they celebrate at Hanukkah the rededication it's a time of dedication but it's also a time of reflection on poor leadership and false shepherds so it's important to understand when Jesus here talking about the Good Shepherd is talking about a time or is looking back rather upon a time when the nation of Israel had some bad false shepherds and here in this portion that we're going to read in just a second Jesus starts it off with another I am statement now this I am statement significant because the Jews knew the name of God as let's try this again the Jews knew the name of God as I am so when Jesus said I am the bread of life I am the door to the sheepfold I am the Good Shepherd what was he claiming he was claiming to be God and they knew it and they hated him for it but here he says I am the Good Shepherd and and the Shepherd uh, was a good image of a leadership for the nation of Israel because Moses and David were both shepherds something that the people could recognize in the first part of this pastor he's past passage he says I am the door to the sheepfold now he's saying he is the shepherd and 
he is now referring to the example of a good shepherd who takes the flock to safe to safety to water to food you got to imagine a desert climate not a lot of places for sheep to eat and sheep if they eat the wrong thing it could kill them water is cr crucial so here Jesus is saying basically I'm the good shepherd who will take the flock out to a good watering hole I will find them something to eat and then at night I'll bring them back and put them in the sheepfold and I will lay across the doorway and protect them and that is where we get to John chapter 10 verse 11 read with me there it says I am the good shepherd the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and and scatters them he flees because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me even as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep I have other sheep which are not of this fold and what do you think he's talking about there I think this is a very uh, perhaps debated obscure passage I think he's talking about Jews versus Gentiles I have other sheep okay the other sheep are us he says if I have other sheep not of this fold I must bring them also they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd for this reason the father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again no one has taken it away from me but I lay it down on my own initiative I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again this commandment I received from my father now a division occurred again amongst the Jews because of these words many of them were saying he has a demon and is insane why do you listen to him others were saying these are not the sayings of one demon possessed a demon cannot open the eyes of the blind can he at that time the feast of dedication took place at the temple let's pray God we just thank you for your word we thank you for the fact that you love us enough to die for us today may we look into your word and allow you to speak to our hearts in Jesus name we pray amen see at this time it was the dedication that took place at Jerusalem the feast of dedication a time when they reflected on bad false shepherds and here Jesus and the first thing that this passage speaks to us about is that the good shepherd loves his sheep more than he loves his life the good shepherd loves his sheep look at look in verse 11 it says I am the good shepherd the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep verse 14 I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me even as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep I have other sheep which are not of this fold I must bring them in also that they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd you know what it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile today if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior you're in one flock with one shepherd For this reason the father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again no one has taken it away from me but I lay it down on my own initiative I have authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again you see the good shepherd loves his sheep more than he loves his life apologize for the slides we lost a few words here and there but notice the relationship they're his sheep he is the owner he says I know my sheep and my sheep know 
me. He's invested in the sheep. The emphasis here is the personal relationship the shepherd has for the sheep. They have meaning. They have value. They're worth saving. Well, today, maybe you feel like you have no meaning. Maybe you feel like you have no value. Maybe you feel like your life isn't worth saving. Well, it is. God loves his sheep, therefore he loves you. Notice not only the relationship, but notice the cost. The shepherd's personal investment in the relationship was his life. His personal investment in the relationship was his life. He lays down his life for the sheep. The cost of giving life to the sheep was the giving of his life for the sheep. The Greek word indicating for speaks of substitution. In other words, he was our substitute. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. In other words, for being born sinful... We have to experience death. Okay? That is the wage, something that you're paid, something that you earn. What we've earned is death. Thank the Lord the verse doesn't stop there. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So what he's saying here is the authentic shepherd, in fact, was a sacrificial lamb who gave his life for the world. He died a... I'm going to give you a little theological lesson here. A penal substitutionary death. Why did he have to die? Because even though the shepherd's good, we're not. We're depraved. We're wicked. We're at our very core corrupted by sin. You know, I think that's evidence. (laughs) You know, we talk about the innocence of children, okay? But do you have to teach a child to do bad? No. They don't call it the terrible twos because of how great a time it is, right? It's the terrible twos or threes, and sometimes it lasts a little bit longer because it's a very trying time. Their nature is to do bad. You tell them don't do that, you know what they do? Do that. You tell them to do something, and you know what they do? They don't do it. See, we're depraved. We're wicked. Jesus said there's none good but God. Therefore, he's God because he's the good shepherd. We're not good. If we were good, we wouldn't need Jesus. But at our very core, we are corrupted by sin, and he died to atone for our sin. We believe in what's called the penal substitutionary theory of atonement. Now, that's a lot of theology right there, but I want to explain it. We believe that Jesus was 100% God and 100% sinless man. Now, since he was one of us, he could represent us. You see, it's important to believe that he was 100% God and 100% man. Because since he was 100% man, he could be our substitution. The wages of sin is death. Death has to occur because of sin Galatians 4 4 through 5 says this God sent his son born under the law to redeem those under the law we are under God's law God's law God gave us the law in the Old Testament if you if you want to know what God's law is the foundation of God's law is the Ten Commandments now you've all heard the pastor stand up here and say how many people has told a lie raise your hand how many people has stolen something okay you're a bunch of lying thieves Uh, the uh, we all know that we're sinners we don't want to admit it sometimes but we all know that we're sinners we cannot keep the law and you know what the law will never save us that is what the religious people were trying to do they were trying to be saved by keeping the law and jesus said look you know what, you're not keeping the law because if you lust after a woman, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. If you hate somebody, you've already murdered them in your heart. The requirement of the law is so great 
that we can't keep it. Why? Because of our nature that is given to sin. The law does not fix our problem. It only reveals the problem. We can't keep the law. We can't fulfill the law. But there's somebody that can. Somebody that identifies with us because he's 100% sinless man and 100% God. In fact, the Bible says Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to what? Fulfill it. Jesus' perfect, perfect sinless life fulfilled the law. And then he died as our substitute to atone. You know the word atone we talked about last week? It's like it, to cover. The pitch that was put on the outside of the ark covered the ark. The wood alone wasn't enough to keep the water out. You had to put pitch on it to keep the water out. Pitch covered the ark. It provided protection. It provided salvation. That's what atonement does. It provides salvation. It provides, in the case of Jesus, not just the covering, but the removal of your sin. He was the substitute that bore our sin and shame on the cross. In other words, you're not saved. You're not going to go to heaven by what you do or what you do not do. Being a good person will never get you into heaven, according to, John, to the Bible. What will get you into heaven? What will get you eternal life? Believing in what Jesus did on the cross for you when he was your substitute. The wages of sin is death. But you know what? There's a substitute made for you. The penal substitutionary theory of atonement confer confirms the biblical teaching of the total depravity of all humans. God would not have gone so far to put his precious son to death had it not been absolutely necessary. See, we are, as humans, are totally unable to meet our own need. And that's the beauty of it. God didn't leave it up to us. He put our salvation in the hands of his son. We also learn that God's nature isn't one-sided nor is there any tension between his aspects. What does that mean? It's not meanly, doesn't mean that he's merely righteous and demanding. Nor does it mean he's merely loving and giving. Have you noticed that some preachers and some theologians want to focus on one thing like hellfire and brimstone? And other people want to focus on, well, God's loving and he, he loves you. And they don't ever mention righteousness holiness and justice they might only miss, 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 mention grace mercy and love or you might have someone here, over here who only mentions judgment condemnation hellfire and brimstone but they don't ever mention grace mercy and love see his righteousness he is righteous so much so that sacrifice for sin had to be provided he is loving so much that he provided the sacrifice himself. There's no other way of salvation but by grace. And it's because of the infinite value of the death of Jesus Christ. And that covers the sins for all time. You realize that when you put your faith and trust in Christ, he forgives you of your past, your present, and your future sins. He died on the cross for the sins that you would commit that you haven't committed yet. He is the once and for all, forever sacrifice for sin. The wages of sin is death. And in his sacrifice, in his death, there's security. Think about that. If your faith and trust is in what Jesus did on the cross, it's secure. If your faith and trust is in what you do, we're just going to mess up. We're just going to let him down. We're, we're, we're never going to be able to keep his law. We've already learned that we're a bunch of lying thieves. And you know what? Even after we become a believer, we still have to deal with the flesh. That's not until we get to heaven. The good shepherd loves his sheep more than his life.
In 1 John 4, 10, it says, This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. If you're hearing this today, it's because he loves you and he wants you to be part of his flock. He loves you so much, he was your substitute when it came to dying. You know, there's a difference between a business owner and an employee. All you business owners, your head's kind of perked up there a minute, right? There's a difference. Think about that. There's a difference between a business owner and an employee. You know, a business owner, they're always working, right? I mean, there's, it, 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 it's, it's all about their business. They poured their life, their, I mean, their sweat, their tears, their blood into the business. It's their life work. It's their, it's their investment. And then you have the employee. Let me ask you this. If the business catches on fire, would an, would an employee risk his life to go in and put out the fire? Probably not. He'd probably stand outside thinking, I'm glad I'm not the owner. Let's be honest. Well, this really stinks, but you know what? Uh, it's, not my, it's not my to worry about. All I do is show up and do what I do, and at the end of the day, I collect the paycheck and leave. But the business owner loses his life's work. He loses his, all of his investments. He's poured hour after hour into this business, and it's cost him everything he's had to own. But for the employee, the worst case scenario is he may just lose his job. You know how easy it is right now to find a job? If somebody does not have a job right now, it's because they don't want a job. <laughs> I mean, everywhere I go, I've never seen anything like this in all of my life. Now hiring. We'll interview you right now. You can start tomorrow. I mean, I think the only prerequisite is yeah, you're good. <laughs> the employee can just go get another job, but the owner loses everything. Well, that's where we find ourselves with the second point of this passage. The hired hand loves his life more than the sheep. The hired hand loves his life more than the sheep. Boy, these <laughs> slides are a catastrophe today, but that's okay. <clears throat> It's what happens when you take them out of one program and put them into another. But <clears throat> if you write this down, the hired hand loves his life more than the sheep. Look with me in verse 12. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Well, who were the hired hands that Jesus was referring to? Now, remember the context of the Feast of Dedication. But also remember who he was speaking to. Religious people who had no relationship with God. Anyone not aligned with God is a hired hand here, is a false shepherd. Uh, remember what I said about the Maccabean era. The leaders of Israel led them into spiritual bondage. Anyone not aligned with Jesus is a hired hand and essentially the hired hand turns out to be listen the hired hand turns out to be an enemy of the shepherd not just the wolf the hired hand is also an enemy why because of his failure to do his duty he allows the wolf to kill the sheep to scatter the sheep to destroy the sheep see there's a lot of people who say they align with Jesus but they really aren't they're claiming to know the way to God, just like the Jews were, and telling others about that same way to God, but it wasn't God's way. And in turn, the hired hands turns out to be the enemies. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the ones who Jesus told, you are of your father, the devil. 
You see, they stood on this earth as the representative of God. But they weren't representing God. They were representing the devil. Well, the third and final thing we see here this morning is that the wolf just loves to take the life of the sheep. The wolf just loves to take the life of the sheep. Who, who is the wolf? Well, some, I mean, at first, let's just take a first glance. Who do you think the wolf is? Audience participation here. Satan, okay? Yeah, at first glance, uh, and a lot of people would say the alpha wolf is Satan, the devil, the father of lies. But the alpha wolf has a pack, don't he? And Jesus warns, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, ravenous wolves. And Paul warns the leaders of the church of Ephesus, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from your own cells will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. So in a sense, there are these wolves who look like sheep, who are saying that we're from God and we represent God, but really what are they doing? They're just tearing up, they're destroying people's lives. They're saying, they're telling people that they're going to heaven as they're dying, going to hell. They're telling people that there's another way to get to heaven other than Jesus Christ. Though they might even say, well, you've got to believe in Jesus Christ, but you also have to do this, this, and this. Or that Jesus Christ is only a way. Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So in a sense, the wolves are false teachers, the devil, his demons. Well, I, I like what John Piper says about this. He says there are three wolves. The first wolf is sin. You know, oftentimes when we do something, who do we like to blame? The devil. Well, you know, I was the devil tempted me. The devil made me do it. Have, don't raise your hand if you've ever said that before. Well, the devil made me do it. No, you did it because you wanted to. I did it because I wanted to. We need to take personal responsibility for our sin. He says, first, there's the sin of wolf, or the wolf of sin. John 1, 29 says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Sin, he says, is a wolf that destroys the world and cuts us off from God. And Jesus came into the world to draw the wolf of sin off the world and onto himself and to die in the place of his sheep. You know what's killing us? It's not the devil. It's sin. It's our sin. And here's the thing. We're just as helpless as a little lamb standing in front of a wolf. We can't do anything about it. But Jesus can. Piper goes on to say the second and third wolves are death and divine judgment. Death is the great destroyer. It attacks and destroys everyone, great and small, rich and poor, men and women, every race, every creed. It's an omnivorous wolf of destruction. But you know what? It doesn't just end at death. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto man once to, to die, and after that, the judgment. Death doesn't destroy by ending what we had planned in this life and leading to nothingness. It destroys by ending what we had planned in this life and leading us, as Piper says, into the eternal courtroom of God Almighty whose law we have broken and whose glory we have despised. The wolves of sin, shame, death, judgment, the devil, and his demons, false teachers, will destroy and take you away to eternal destruction with them. You know what? Thank God we have a good shepherd who is willing to lay down his life, who in fact did lay down his life for his sheep. He laid down his life for his sheep. And he, and he, he says, I, I don't only lay it down. You see, it doesn't stop at his death. He says, but I have the power to take it back up. It's not just his death. 
but it's also his resurrection. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away. You know they didn't kill Jesus? Jesus willingly laid down his life. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. In other words, I have the authority to offer this sacrifice, to be the penal substitutionary atonement for your sin. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up. This commandment I received from my Father. And then, guess what happened at the end of Jesus' teaching? A division occurred. You know, when I preach, oftentimes there might be a division amongst the hearers. Okay? Some of you are saying, amen. I believe that. Preach on. Some of you are saying that's ridiculous. I don't believe that. Well, today I, I want to close with the most critical question that anyone can ever answer. And that is, are you one of Christ's sheep? Are we his sheep? That is, do you hear and respond to his voice? Are you following him? Do you trust in the saving work and promise of life? Verse 27 and 28, he says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them. And they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. I plead you with you this morning. If you hear Jesus' voice speaking to you, follow him. See, he calls you to trust him. And if there's any desire in you at all right now to believe in Jesus, if there's anything in you saying, I believe in Jesus, it's because God is at work in your heart. You would never have those thoughts apart from God. You know what happens? When you say, I believe in what Jesus Christ did on the cross for my sin, that he was my substitute, he gets the glory. This is the way that God gets the glory for our salvation. We won't be like the Jews in the passage who were self-righteous. But really, they weren't righteous at all. The only one who was righteous was Jesus. And the only way we can be righteous is to have him give us his righteousness. Let me say that again. The only way that you can be righteous this morning is for him to give you his righteousness. Have you accepted that? Have you answered the call to be his sheep? Let's pray. God, today we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Today we know that the gospel is that Jesus Christ died on the cross. It's 100% God, 100% man a sinless atoning sacrifice for our sin. But the question is, is, have we made that our own? Not just do we know it in our head, but do we have a relationship with God? Do we know the shepherd? Maybe there's someone here this morning who does not know you as their Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord, that right now they would repent of their sin Say, I, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I can't do anything to save myself. I know that in my heart I'm, I'm wicked. I'm evil. I'm, a, I'm hopeless. But I believe with all of my heart that Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sin. That you was my substitute. That you paid the price with your life so that I could have life. And God, I, I pray, Lord, that right now somebody would trust you with all of their heart.
confess you as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Please stand with us this morning. God has spoken to your heart. We have this time now where you're, we call it an invitation. You're invited, come. Jesus gave an invitation, come, believe. Maybe this morning you believe in your heart. You know what? The Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Maybe you believe in your heart, but you've never told the world. I believe. Jesus is speaking to you right now. I ask that you step out and come forward. And I'll pray with you and I'll talk to you and you can share with this family of believers that you believe as they sing. Amazing grace How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm free. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught. My heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Chains are gone, not been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns unending love.
of gentlemen who are who have expressed interest in taking membership in the church. And uh, we have two prerequisites. Uh, first of all, is baptism by immersion. We believe in believer's baptism. And the second one is to, to uh, take our new, our perspective members course, rather, uh, which is either called Foundations or Fundamentals. I can't remember off the top of my head. But uh, we are going to be starting one of those classes here soon. Uh, so if you are interested in taking membership, uh, please see Adam, uh, who is on the drums behind me, because uh, he is the one who teaches this class, and it will be taught during Sunday school. So if you're interested in taking a member, if you, I mean, even if you don't, I mean, maybe if you think maybe down the road I want to take membership, you can still take the class. Uh, it's not, it doesn't mean that just because you take the class that you uh, become a member or have to become a member. It's just, it's one of our pre two prerequisites just so you understand what we believe as a, a church, a denomination, and, uh, uh, and so forth. So uh, with that said, if you're interested in membership, please talk to Adam. Uh, otherwise, we're going to go ahead and close out with a word of prayer. I want to thank you for coming, and God speaking, has spoken to your heart today, uh, and maybe you want to talk some more about it. I want to encourage you to come just tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, uh, you know, God's speaking to me, and I want to talk to you about it. One final reminder. Uh, on your way out, please, uh, this is a, a tremendously worthy ministry. LifeWise Academy, Junction City Elementary. Uh, it's starting this week, Tuesday night. Please try to come and pray if you can. Uh, I think we're going to stretch all the way around the building and pray. Uh, over the building and for the school and for the students uh, that lives will be changed over 120 kids I mean where can you get that kind of response uh, and it's during the school day praise the Lord for that so it's an exciting time in Junction City and uh, so please don't forget to give anything that's given will be doubled $120 will send two kids for one year so let's pray God we thank you for this day that you've blessed us with and for this opportunity that we have to worship you. God, we pray, Lord, that you would take this offering that we're about to give and that you would multiply it and bless it and use it in a mighty powerful and powerful way to change the lives of uh, the children in our community, which will ultimately change our community. God, we pray, Lord, that you would just bless the teachers, bless the administration, bless the, the, uh, the, the board of directors, uh, who are overseeing this tremendous work. We pray, Lord, that you would bless, uh, bless them and that you would help things to go smoothly. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would put a hedge of protection around them involving the spiritual battle that uh, is raging right now over the lives of these children. God, we pray, Lord, that you would prepare their hearts to hear the gospel and that they would put their faith and trust in you as their Lord and Savior. We thank you, God, for what you're doing here. We pray for all of those people who are out today who are traveling, who are at the baptism. Uh, and God, I just pray, Lord, that you would just be with them. We pray for uh, Bob and Jean, that you would just have your healing hand upon them and uh, that you would just uh, really touch them. God, we just ask that you would move and heal them of this and help them to overcome it. Uh, but we thank you, God, that we are overcomers, not because of what we've done, but because of what you've done. And we pray, Lord, that I pray, Lord, that if there's someone who does not know you, who has not answered the call to be one of your sheep yet, God, I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to work in their hearts, continue to move in their life, continue to show them you, that you, their need for you and, and how much you love them. And God, we thank you for loving us enough to lay down your life for us. We just praise you and give you all the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you for coming.